felt the need to trace a map of the world. And on it, note all the places, even the most remote, that have heard about the messages of Medjugorje. Today, people are flocking here from all these places. Some of them come from Moscow. Civil servants, Kremlin ideologists who come for a spiritual retreat, who talk humbly about their errors, who are returning to God and eager to absorb each one of Our Lady's words, to live by them and thereby rebuild their lives. That's what gives me enthusiasm and strength, turning myself continually towards the Virgin and, like Jesus and Nether, just to be obedient and grow in wisdom, grace and knowledge. I'm one of those priests who have decided to devote their time to spreading the message and to act as witnesses among our contemporaries, building on Our Lady's messages, close presence and blessings. The story I tell about Medjugorje is a simple one. I tell about the event, how it started, how it developed, how it all began with the presence of the six young visionaries and their families within the framework of a small parish in a remote part of the world, a small people, a movement which spread beyond its geographical boundaries to the world at large. I was born here on March 19, 1949, on the feast of St. Joseph, and that is how I got my name. I remember a painful experience that has marked my soul. It was the repeated arrests of priests taken from the monastery to prison, persecution. There was always someone in prison for three months, six months, a whole year or several years. Meanwhile, I waited, expecting any day to hear that Father Ferdo had been taken or Father Vensel or others. They were all arrested, one after the other. They were not criminals, no. We all knew well why they had gone to prison. These were men who had an ideal and were ready to suffer for it. Father Yozo was always silent, modest and gentle. What do I know? He did not talk much. He seemed always to think about something. He was mostly silent and gentle. I saw him most often in Mostarsko Blato tending sheep or cows or doing some other task. Yes, um. I told my parents that I wanted to become a Franciscan. And they accepted. I remember talking to my father. We went walking to Shiriki Brieg. He explained to me very wisely what it meant. The sacrifices involved. and how such a vocation called for continual sacrifices. He asked me to think it well over, and if, after that, I still felt that I wanted it, and that it really was God's calling, then he too would be happy that I answer that vocation. And later, we went, it was the first time I had left home, with a suitcase to Shiroki Brieg, where a bus was waiting. It drove us to Imotski and then to Split, and from Split by boat to the island of Bol.
I remember a boy, that same evening we arrived by boat. When we got to the monastery, he felt so much at home that he ran down to the edge of the sea, plunged his hands into the water and called out to us, Hey boys, come and see, it is really salty. And we all went down to try out the surprising salty taste. <laughs> He was a bit withdrawn, he used to keep a distance, but he was kind. One would say that he would not step on an ant. He was never aggressive. However, we should not praise him too much. He was a shy, fine boy, but not brilliant, nothing special. A good, very good pupil. In sports, precisely because he was quite withdrawn, he did not play any important role. I would not say that he was marginal, but something like that. You see, in soccer he would be in the goalkeeper and such. I love natural science, which I found particularly interesting. I wanted to know all about biology and chemistry. But then I liked all the subjects, because I saw everything as being interlinked, with nothing in secondary place. Our teachers gave their maximum, and we were expected to do likewise. At the end of our garden is a grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes. There I often found him in prayer. I also used to meet him in a chapel in the attic. He was often up there. I want to underline that this type of piety, the four years that he stayed in our house, in the place where prayer and work were alive, must have had some effect on the future events in Medjugorje. It was on the 14th of July, 1962. I received into my arms from my provincial a habit that had been blessed together with this cord, and I put it on for the first time. My mother had crocheted three of these cords with her own hands because she was a third order Franciscan. And I put it around my waist. A photo was taken in which one can see that we are both wearing this Franciscan cord. There were 12 of us, but only a couple of months later, in the autumn, we were called up to the army, and we had to interrupt our novitiate. It was that strict. I did my military service in Prizren, in Kosovo, but thank God I did not complete the entire term, because my eyes became sick. So I had to go for exams in Skopje and later to Pristina, where a commission discharged me temporarily. And later, in Lubuski, a commission declared me definitively unfit for service. My eyesight got worse while at high school. Once, when I was rubbing my eyes, I noticed all of a sudden that I couldn't see with my left eye. I was still a student, and my headmaster sent me to Sarajevo, to a famous professor, whose name was Chavka. I was hospitalized, and he said that my cornea should be replaced, but that it would be a complicated operation. So, I was not operated. My situation grew worse and worse. But my professor, whose name was Father Cherubim, went to Lourdes and brought back some Lourdes water and prayed for me. He was very sad to see that I was losing my sight. He took me under his wing, told me that he had prayed for me. He gave me a bottle of this Lord water and showed me how to wash my face with it, what to do, 
and to turn to Our Lady and to God with faith. I did what he said, and my eyes were cured. I could see. In my encounters with Father Yozo, I got the impression that he was very open to God. From the very beginning, I felt in him an inner fire and love for God, which touched me deeply. Father Yozo could have closed himself off from this love of God, this acting presence of God. This is what mostly touched me inside. So I also gave in to this presence of God who can work through me and through every person. After the army, we finished the novitiate and our studies. We went to Sarajevo, but Sarajevo was a mixed environment. Faculties, university, and all those institutions. It was very evident that preference was given to those who denied their religion, their nationality, their origin. It clearly meant that in the society in Sarajevo, at the university, in political life, in sports, in culture, they would be the privileged ones. People who rebelled against all this ended in prison, especially Croatians. I did not know Father Jozo before. I only knew that there would be a priest who gives good retreats. I am convinced now that it was the power of God and the power of Our Lady. In Ukraine, we would say, my seventh sense told me that retreats here must be of a high spiritual level. And I was not mistaken. The first Mass said in one's parish feels like being embraced by one's parishioners and also a bit like entering into the heart of the faithful to ask them to pray with love and responsibility for your new life as a priest, for your vocation, your mission. A great crowd had turned up from my village and from the neighboring villages. We put on our priestly apparel in the house where I was born, and so clothed, we followed the narrow path. The fences, walls, houses, passages were all decked with flowers, paper decorations, and with wishes of congratulation. It was the heart of the whole village that flowered that day. Yuzu is a perfectionist in every sense, and he demands perfection from his interpreters. He does not only demand literal translation, which means word by word whatever he says, but more than that. I remember well when he told me in 1990, when he called me personally, I do not only ask you to translate, but that it becomes a charisma. This means that his charisma should pass through the translation. After my studies, I went to Cherin, where I was the assistant of the parish priest. It was the late Father Gabriel, with the late Luca De Polo and Givo Kustic, who initiated the Catechism Olympics. My parish at Cherin immediately registered, and we won first place. The prize was a trip to Rome and an audience with the Holy Father. Later, when I was assigned to Bosuchier, there was another catechism tournament on the history of the Church. That was the topical subject at the time. So thousands of young children started to learn all about their Church, from the baptism of their people onto the present day. 
In these Olympics also, we were the best. At that time, I was already in Posuche. He was tireless with young people, tireless. He was never able to say, he never knew how to say that he was tired. Just as here today, he speaks the whole day, and when he comes, he drinks quickly something while standing, like a cup of tea, and he goes. If there is no tea, he takes an apple, and off he goes. He speaks the whole day. Rising is at six, mass is at seven, and he continues. As soon as we leave the church, he continues with foreigners. I wanted to live my priesthood fully. I did not allow anyone to hinder it or limit it, whether through ideology or vested interests. I wanted to go the whole way, to do my maximum for Jesus, for the Church, for the Kingdom of God. This does not mean that I've done the best. It does not mean that I've done anything special. Just in my heart of hearts, I know that I've done my best. When he would come to the church, when he had Mass, people would say loudly, Father Yozo is here, the Mass will be long. There was nothing superficial in Father Yozo. Everything was thorough. Mass cannot be quick. It has to be said piously, and so maybe people have the experience of some saying Mass quickly. Father Yozo does nothing quickly. Everything is exact, thorough, pronounced, accomplished, he's praying a lot, he is fasting a lot, still today. I had just finished installing these classrooms at Bosushi. There were five in all, on the ground floor, so that each catechist could have his own room. At last I had what I had wanted all my life, to be able to say, be seated and see each child sit down at his or her own small table, that they could have all that a classroom needs. I wasn't given the chance to start the new school year. I was very upset about that. Father Yozo was transferred to Medjugorje. It was terribly difficult for him. Now, as he could start to work well, he had to go, to leave everything. And he told me once, Lyarka, what am I going to do in Medjugorje? Come on, Father Yozo, I answered. God will take care of your work. It's important that you go. And if you have nothing to do, he had so many books. I think that he had a truck full of books when he left. So I said, by the time you just look at the title of each book, one year will be over. And after a year, you can say, I have no work, I am leaving. You have that, right? So he smiled a little. I could not say that I was enthusiastic to go to Medjugorje. I was upset at being transferred. My first idea when coming to Medjugorje was to work a little more actively with the Franciscan Third Order. I wanted to form a prayer group with young people who went to school outside the parish. There were none of the visionaries in the group, they were younger. Just before the very beginning of the apparitions, I gave a retreat here to religious sisters who were preparing for their final vows. They asked me news about my parish, and I told them, I came here and I accepted to give this retreat in order to accomplish a vow. I want to pray for my parish, that it receive a special grace to enable it to move forward. There are many priestly vocations in my parish, and I would like it to be kindled with the spirit of prayer, the spirit of love, so that all are aware of belonging to the Church and are filled with the spirit of piety. For me, he is surely a great person, a witness, a hero, a fighter of Our Lady and her presence here, in spite of all opposition, in spite of all the suffering in the past and in the present. For us who are younger, 
It is much easier as long as he lives, as long as all those are alive who were here from the very beginning for Our Lady and with Our Lady. And the children came in like little birds, flooding out from the nest. The door opened and they came running towards me with such a warm spontaneity that I was puzzled because I thought in my heart, I was not at home, and the communists must have found them and managed to convince them, or have given them drugs or somehow manipulated them. Through the children they have tried to set something up to bring discredit upon our faith and to ridicule it. The children remained opened, although it was not easy for them. I had put a great pressure on them. During that week, two priests came from Humak. I remember very well two young priests who met Vika's mother, Jakob's mother, and some other parents in the presbytery and told them, these children are possessed. But I heard this word. Vika's mother was in a state of shock. She made the sign of the cross, saying, My God, what is happening to me? I asked the priests to be careful, not to say such things. I consoled the woman. No, not at all. On the contrary. I wanted to say this because of the many things said by certain people, priests or persons whose curiosity compels them to feel competent to judge and interpret as they wish, without any due respect. It was interesting to observe that each one said and interpreted differently, but it was clear that nobody was in awe of God. That is why all these visible signs began, miraculous signs, first wonders and healings. It was important to step back and stop these facile statements and negative innuendos concerning the visions. It was essential to stop these superficial and rash interpretations about something that is still an embryo and about to grow into something magnificent and serious. Our Lady knew all that and knew how to lead us forward by another route. It has never been sufficiently emphasized that the children were imprisoned, put under house arrest. Police were actually stationed at the doors of their homes. This is forgotten, but it is true. Our Lady chose Port Bordeaux, Medjugorje, a significant place, full of thorn bushes and stones, to have us undergo a spiritual transplantation. On Port Bordeaux, the Virgin takes our hearts of stone, dumps them onto the hillside, and implants us with a new heart. She pulls out the weeds, thorns, and rough stones from our heart, and plants virtues. Thus, everything we used to be is left up there on Port Bordeaux, and a new being comes down. The bishop called me to Chitluk in order to avoid coming to Medjugorje, and we had lunch in Chitluk. In the course of lunch, he asked me in an offhand way, Father Yozo, what's happening in the parish? I started to explain, and he immediately brought up the comparison with Lourdes. For me, that was very difficult. When we had finished lunch, I asked him to come. He promised to come. He did not come that same day, but a day later. He 
Already in Chitluk, I had told him that I had recorded all of the interrogations of the children on tape, but that I was not convinced by these one-to-one -one conversations. For me, these were just an account and nothing special by the way of testimony. He had also brought a small tape recorder and talked with the children in the presbytery. But he was wiser than me and acted as a bishop. He made them speak under oath. He placed them before the cross and said, Now, children, swear that you will tell me the truth. That was something I hadn't thought of. After a bit more than two hours, the bishop came out and said enthusiastically, Now I'm a hundred percent sure the children aren't lying. They're telling the truth. I took his hand. In his left hand, he was holding the tape recorder. I pulled him by the right hand into the dining room. The children remained in front of the door of the presbytery. Inside, I told him, How can you say this after only two hours? Why are you so sure? I would like to know, because I cannot be so sure. And he looked at me and simply but firmly refused to say anything else but, how can you speak like that? What do you want? Do you want to see Our Lady as well? That put me in my place. Without a word, I went back to my office. I felt upset, but the bishop announced he would come to Mass. He came and encouraged the children. He said he had been to Lourdes and Fatima, that he loved those places of pilgrimage, that he knew about the apparitions, and that he accompanied pilgrimages. Later, on the occasion of the confirmations, he said that these things were happening here also. He encouraged the children even more on the day of the confirmations and asserted with emphasis, the children are not lying, they are telling the truth. We must do whatever the children tell us. Father Yozo defended his position until the end, not asking what it may cost and what the consequences might be. He defended his position at the truth. He stood for them. He showed it. He went into prison because of Medjugorje and because of what he witnesses with his own life. It was early in the morning, about 6.30 a.m., while I was washing, Father Ferdo knocked at the door and said, They are looking for you. I knew who was looking for me. One of the policemen showed his badge and presented himself. Then he approached me and said, Come with us. I went to my room, but he followed me and didn't allow me to put on my Franciscan habit. He made me remain in civilian clothes. I didn't want that. I explained that my clothing was my Franciscan habit. But I didn't manage to persuade him. I would have liked to have worn it. Outside the door, two policemen asked, Shall we handcuff him? He said, No. I 
Hardly anybody knows it, but I could have avoided going into prison. It was easy. How? Because they told me, for three days only, leave the parish. I said that I could not. I could not leave the parish for three days. We will settle everything and you won't be held responsible. Go and take a rest. No, no. Thank you for the rest and for your proposal. I cannot do it. I cannot leave these people. I cannot abandon my parish. They said, you must close the church. No, I do not allow you to close it. I myself cannot close it either. Because this church was built so that people can pray in it. So they saw that no compromise, no further dialogue was possible. They thought that they could put a stop to all this, that it was enough to send me away to put a stop to Međugorje. I had no illusions. Leaving the house, I knew that I must go to prison. And in my heart of hearts, I had prepared myself. I had come to terms with the idea. I knew why I was suffering, and that was that. I was not afraid, because I knew God would take care of me. I prayed, O oh Lord, be my guide, and if my sacrifice has any value, let it be for your glory and for the fruits of Our Lady's messages and the good of people who suffer and who come here. We have the energy that God gives us, and I think that Father Yozo has received a special charisma, a special energy. He is a contemplative. He is in permanent communion with God. And this deep unity with God, according to me, gives him this desire of perfection around him. A man who is deeply immersed in the presence of God cannot support what is too human, what is worldly, what is not a reflection of heaven. According to me, he lives already with one foot in heaven. He is already so much oriented towards what is heavenly that it makes him very tired when he has to accept all the limitations of what is temporary and what is human, of what is worldly around him. Each time the jailer turns the key of the cell, everything reverberates. It can be heard as high up as the stars. It is incredible, the echo of those doors, of that lock, of the whole machinery. It was so painful to hear this over and over again. The most difficult for me was that I had lost the notion of time, of the calendar. I no longer knew whether it was day or night, nor did I know how many days I had been in prison. Exactly at 5 o'clock, as usual, I came and I found Dr. Victor Nuic and another Franciscan in front of the door. I said, what's new? He said, we need you. And we entered. I said, what is the matter? He said, Father Yozo is in prison and the provincial thinks that he needs a lawyer. They were looking in Sarajevo, in Split, here and there. Then Zivko Kustic told them, ask Vukovic, he will probably be ready to take the case. 
So I started this informative conversation with them. What is it? How is it? Where is it? And I said to Viktor Nuic that I have only two conditions. The first condition was that I am allowed to choose the defense tactics. The second condition was that Bible scholars find for me in the Bible the words light, darkness, chains, etc. These words were in all the newspapers, namely in connection with the number 40, because that year was commemorated the 40th anniversary of Tito at the head of the party. They had put these scriptural words into the context of their political vocabulary in order to accuse him. I told Father Yozo to answer all the questions with, I do not feel guilty, I have not committed any criminal act, has all the charismatics, I have founded my homilies on the Holy Scripture and nothing else. In that sense, I was also answering all the remarks of the president of the court. Listen, comrade president, really, here, the Holy Scripture is on the bench of the accused. The district attorney told me then, do not speak to me like this. We also have read Holy Scripture. I answered him, this accusation came about because you have not read it enough. The worst is that you felt the deep human need to let out the truth and couldn't because they'd already ruled you guilty. You had no chance, no way of defending yourself. They didn't allow you to choose a course that would shed light and lead the way to truth. They had only one thing in mind, by definition you were guilty, and that was that. It was quite, quite tense. It was an eminently political trial. This Jerkic and the late Branko Mikulic expected very much from this trial to break, to disperse Medjugorje. During this trial, the phenomenon of Medjugorje grew onto planetary dimensions. The whole world started to perceive it differently. It was in the news that he was convicted. Nobody was told when he was coming. The policeman, whose name I have forgotten, whispered to me only, Father Yozo has arrived. I said, in the collection center? He said, yes. I was walking, and then I ran into the workshop, took the tools, and went to the canteen. I arrived in the quarantine and saw him in civilian clothes. How are you? I asked. Good, he answered. What happened? For what did they condemn you? I know why I am here, but you, he said, because of Our Lady. God was jail terrible. I had to be very careful because people were ready to do anything for me. On the very first day in Mostar, the policeman, a man from Montenegro, confiscated my cigarettes. He came back four or five days later, threw my cigarettes on the table and said, light one up. I said, no thanks, I don't smoke. From the moment he'd confiscated my cigarettes, I had stopped smoking. But I hadn't told my friends and relatives, so they continued to send me cigarettes, which I then distributed to my poor fellow inmates. I was really happy to help them in this small way. I met men there who'd been separated from their loved ones for years. They'd been cut off from their families. 
They were political prisoners for whom one thing was important, the fact that a priest was among them. Throughout the year 1982, whenever we could meet up as a group, I would speak to them about St. Francis. I spoke loudly so that hundreds could hear me. It was a real opportunity to get them to know about St. Francis and Franciscan spirituality. It was a great joy for me. Many of them, political prisoners, had never been allowed to return home. And many years later, I heard their confessions. So in my heart I was able to say, it's for this reason that I am in prison. I can help people and comfort them. It was a simple life, that of a priest among the lowly. As much as I have noticed, one could talk very well with him, but after his father's death, he became very sad. This struck him, I think, much more than the trial, more than the trial. It was really hard. I know that his life had been shortened because of what had happened. It had been a terrible shock and a painful blow to him. He was an intelligent man. He perceived their plans, their projects, and had measured their strong desire for vengeance. My brothers and sisters also suffered, as did the whole family and region, my countrymen also. Already back in prison, they started preparing me for the idea that I could not go back to Medjugorje, that I should not go back to Medjugorje, that the best thing for me would be to go to a foreign country, that I could get my passport at any time. They told me that it was dangerous, and that if I did go back to Medjugorje, I would soon be back in prison. I kept repeating that I was the parish priest of Medjugorje, that according to our customs, even while in prison, a parish priest remained in charge of his parishioners. My last encounter with the secret police was on February the 2nd, on the feast of the presentation. They banged the door saying, in any case, you will be transferred. Yes, it caused me great inner suffering. It was a real sacrifice. However, the trial had not broken me but rather had led me to understand that Medjugorje would be there wherever I happened to be. What I mean is that Our Lady invites us to live the messages of Medjugorje wherever we may be. If I live the messages and bear witness to the messages, then I fulfill my commitment to Medjugorje according to the situation I am in at the time. So I made it my task to respect that commitment. I have decided that wherever I am, I would do my utmost to recreate the atmosphere of Medjugorje, be it within my parish or within the hearts of those who come there. I have learned so many things from Father Yozo concerning life, concerning faith, concerning behavior, how to accept humiliations. I saw Father Yozo accepting humiliations and I was shocked. And I said, I also have to learn. It is rightfully so. It is a practical teaching, which one who lives near him can really receive, learn, meditate, think about it. I 
When I came to Gorica, the head of the Communist Party and the brother of the district attorney at my trial, a certain Ante Mlinarevich and Mate Boban, summoned me to Grude and told me, listen, you are a priest meddling in politics. I answered, not at all. I am not interested in politics and I cannot contribute in any way. On the contrary, I am a priest who lives for people, takes care of people, and who lives for his God. No, they said. You preach about Medjugorje and people gather around you. The other priests don't do that. Listen, I said, you are threatening me with prison again. I won't give up and I cannot give up my program. I cannot go back on my path. But my suitcase is always ready. I am ready to take it up again and to go to Focha or to Zenica, wherever you say. But I cannot give up my program. So they again arranged for my transfer, this time to Bukovica. When we came by bus the first time, we passed there at about 4.30. We went with the bus as far as we could go. I went walking to wake up Father Yozo, and he got up gladly, came out, and in front of the church we had a meeting. He spoke to us about God, about Our Lady, about jail. People asked him questions. As much as I remember, he mostly spoke about the Bible, about mass readings, about Abraham's faith, and simply about the messages that people hear here in Medjugorje the message of conversion, of a deep faith and a deep encounter with God, of deciding to go and seek the encounter with God. My memories of Tihelina are very moving. They are sacerdotal memories, those of a priestly mission, of giving oneself totally up to the church, to the poor. Through their sacrifices, prayers and presents, people who came on a pilgrimage at the same time awakened my parish. This created a climate of returning to God, of conversion. Adults were conformed, some were baptized, married, some became fully reconciled to communion within the church. Thus, my memories of Tihalina, as I see them now, is that it was the springtime of my priesthood, a time of fulfillment for a priest, of special love for Our Lady, for the church, and for the priestly vocation. Then I left Tihalina because they took away from me the jurisdiction and title of parish priest. I had to leave Tihalina and my superiors transferred me to Shiroki Brieg. Shiroki Brieg is the place where I was born, the church where I was baptized, the place where I received my vocation, where in my heart I decided to be a Franciscan, a priest. From here, I made my first steps 
And now, like a ship after a long journey across the seas, I was returning to my home port. It is interesting that people in our parish and others have chosen their camp. Nobody is indifferent towards Father Yozo as a person. People either appreciate, respect and love him, or they slander him, cannot support him, say that he is acting and so give him labels. He is not upset about it. It hurts him, but he will rarely show it. I remember a documentary on TV. There was a young boy who'd been wounded and was in tears because he was alone. He had lost everything and everyone around him. The sound of his crying, this voice entered my heart and haunted me all day and all night. As a monk, as a priest, I wanted to respond to this call for help. How can you believe you are alone since I am here? If I am here and millions of others can also turn their eyes, their hearts and souls towards you, something has to be done to help these children. During wartime, I felt a desire to do something, to work, to help in a way. My husband was in combat. I was alone at home and wanted to participate in something. All of a sudden came this call from Father Yozo and the proposition to help him to create and lead a humanitarian association which would help children that have lost one or both parents in war. Adoption at a distance does not consist in giving 30 euros a month. It is a relation that you establish with the child because a child needs love, needs affection and needs security. When godparents succeed to have such a relationship with a child, we have done something. We understand adoption in this way. We have about 650 adopted children in two and a half years since we are involved in it. But we have so much work, so much work, because children need so much. That's when we heard about the island of Yakyan and we came to visit this little island. It was wasteland and desert. I said yes, because it was just such a place we needed. Uninhabited, isolated, not easy of access. I wanted to build up a program of revival, work towards renewing hope, joy, love in the hearts of these children and widows. How to work with these women who come here with their wounds and memories, carrying the scars and marks of what happened to them ten years ago? How to find the remedy, make these people normal again, so that they do not react out of anger, hatred or revenge? I came to the island for the first time in 1996. The first year here, it was a tragedy, complete desolation. I remember something that struck me, these women dressed in black, so sad, children clinging to them, and none dared to move away. They hardly answered the greeting. There was an inner resignation, desolation, and we really felt guilty for being well off. I saw Father Yozo for the first time four years ago on Yaklan. I was alone. When I saw him for the first time, I had a special feeling. 
He is a man who radiates love, great love towards children and women of the fallen soldiers. This is his great gift for the children of the fallen soldiers, because maybe they cannot afford to come to the sea, and more than this, here they can be spiritually renewed in this beautiful little church here. here for the fourth time. When I came first, we were all crying. But as years go by, there are less and less widows who are crying. Not only my children and myself laugh now, but also other widows. To bring a smile back to one's face, I think that it is the goal of this association and of the spiritual renewal and the goal of our Father Yozo, and he will surely continue to persevere in that. We didn't invent programs, they grew spontaneously, and people also felt the urge to help us. I made it clear to my collaborators that we had no right to say, we cannot help you. Why? Because there is God, in whom I believe firmly, and He is love. This is why I have two prayer groups, and this means thousands of people who pray and pray, so that we may never have to say, I cannot help you. Father Yozo is a man who can see far ahead. He is a man who, so many years ago, saw something that none of us saw. These orphans do not only need food. The Red Cross, the United Nations, also give food and money. They need love, to feel that someone thinks of them. It is not a matter of bread alone. They really need affection and love. I think that such a project can help the people, all peoples. There are people who have nothing, people who are forsaken by everyone, people who have no one left to them. And there is also the church, which will always be a mother, to be love, to act out of love for others, to live for others, to help others, I think that there is no end to this program. At the Holy Family Institute, we have put this family of ours and our work with these young girls under the protection of the Holy Family. The girls who live here have had a very sad history. They fled from the refugee camps, and then they came here, they decided to make an effort to get more from life than what they would have had gotten elsewhere. And we gave them that possibility. These girls have lost both of their parents, and they come from all parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We could not receive all those who wanted to join us. We are still not working at full capacity because, on the one hand, we have to seek out the best solutions to pursue our program. We are now facing problems of training and education for young girls who have lost both parents. Secondly, because this house has been conceived as a convent, of Herzegovinian school sisters to be a spiritual model and a haven of hope, peace, strength and light for every one of the girls. So far, the girls and ourselves have not had the good fortune of having the sisters among us because of problems that have arisen. The sisters have not yet been authorized to come and take over the task of educating the girls. In this house, young girls are not here just to be lodged and fed, but to go through a process of growth. The foundations of this house are the commandments of God, the gospel, faith. 
And this is the essential difference with other places. In this house, we take care of each and every girl, of their soul, and of their intellectual, moral, and social development. For the construction of the house of the Holy Family, all the material was brought from Italy by trucks. We had the same work as on Yaklan, but at the end, there is a great peace, not just a satisfaction, but a joy that you can feel inside, your sacrifice, your will, your prayer, your desire to act has given these fruits. I believe that when my collaborators get used to me and come to know me, they want to be fully committed and really give their all. They respond with strength of purpose and know that their efforts are not spilled in vain, trampled over and thrown into a bottomless pit. No, on the contrary, they know that their efforts contribute towards constructing a human being, that love is born of such efforts. The love that takes root in the heart of man, his spirit, growth, evolution and conversion, and this will repay them one hundredfold, like a gift. That is the measure of love I require of my collaborators. It is a grace to meet a pilgrim. Talking to a pilgrim is a vocation, and the mission is one of responsibility. Father Yozo asks from all of us to work in the way he does, giving oneself completely in everything. This is what he is asking from all of us. This means to give one's maximum without holding back anything, to invest all of our force and all of our capacities, intellectual, psychological and physical, to do the work in the best possible way. This is good on one hand, it is good, but we are all human and we who work here cannot function in the way Father Yozo functions. The Holy Spirit often works many miracles through Father Yozo, and we are just ordinary people who sometimes are not able to follow all of this. He is a volcano in his head. I say, Father did not think anymore, but he is a volcano. There are so many initiatives. It is difficult to follow them, but I have seen that all of his initiatives have really been very fruitful, which means that they have brought great fruit on the spiritual level and I would also say on the material level. Many people do not know us, Croatians. Today still, Italians, who are our neighbors after all, talk about ex-Yugoslavia. This hurts my ears. I tell them, listen, we Croatians are a nation that has shared a common border with you for many centuries now. We are a fully-fledged people. We have our great men from all spheres, our witnesses in the church, those who gave their lives as martyrs, who shed their blood for their church and their God. It is a joy for me, and I would feel badly if I did not make my contribution to these martyrs, to tell the whole world what they have done for us. I have to do it. It is my duty. I feel an enormous need to do it. The martyrs are a capital and a gift, and I wish to share my love and veneration for them in the hearts of the parishioners and of the whole world. Why? Because I am a hundred percent convinced that on the tomb of these martyrs, our prayer is heard and our vow received. Here on the tomb of the martyrs, hearts start to open. Here, in Cherokee Briag, people start to move forward. They start their process of coming back to God. Thousands and thousands of people from the whole world. The pilgrims stream in one after another like a flowing river. And the monastery of Cherokee Briag, 
stands like a huge rock of granite washed by their prayers. It is so beautiful, so white, clothed in its light, its dignity. I am happy that I can fulfill my mission here, of all places. I don't like it if people venerate him as a saint. Maybe I have been too strict towards people when they started to talk such things. I came to know him personally. I lived with him. He is a man like all other people. God works through him. What is my role? What is my mission in Medjugorje? Well, I do not look upon Medjugorje or my life in a theoretical way. I am not suddenly going to build a theory as to what I'm supposed to do or have already done. Medjugorje is a calling to which I try to respond permanently. And the answer consists in my trying to build the messages within myself, devoting my whole life to it, bringing to it my talents and gifts with all the necessary patience and perseverance. Важно. 